Welcome back to The Agent Goldmine. Here's what to expect to learn in today's show. How to reverse engineer your goals. Not just think through the number of closings that you want, but the activities required to get there. Breaking it all down and how to track it. Plus, stick around to the end for some nuggets on hiring systems and automations. Today, we're interviewing Kristen Beam. She is out of St. Louis, Missouri. She's been an agent for six years, and she's done a total of over 550 closings with her team. In 2023, she and her team did 118 closings, $40 million in production. She does residential sales in the St. Louis suburbs. She is a co-team leader with her sister. So we talk about leverage. We talk about specifically how she has her field assistant. Uh, So if that is something that you're looking to hire, stick around to the end of this episode. And she gives a solid golden nugget when it comes to reverse engineering. And by the way, her team, she only has three agents and two team leaders in production. And that has, you know, they do over a hundred deals a year. So check it out, give her a follow and enjoy the show. This is the agent goldmine where you'll find real talk, shit talk, and ambition. We're here to build real businesses and be more than your average agent. We want to know what the killers are actually doing within their businesses, the reality of it. All tactical, no fluff. So we're here to find out. Please share and enjoy. Christine, I'm so excited to see you again. Today, we're diving into goal setting and how to reverse engineer that. So what does that mean to you in your life? How do you do it? Let's just fucking jump right in. Yeah, let's do it. So I'm super excited to talk about this. It's something our team in particular has put a huge emphasis on in the last probably 18 months. And it was just a huge light bulb moment for my business partner and I when we kind of sat down and started looking at things because everyone tracks their closings, right? Who doesn't track closings and commissions earned? But a lot of people aren't tracking how they get there. And so we really have been having fun with the data and the statistics to kind of back into that. So you can really set yourself up for success. And I think that's where we're going today. Dude, fuck yeah. And you just said some magic words, data and stats. Like we're so here for that. Okay. So used to, maybe not you, but most people, you know, track the closings and commissions, like you said. So Mm -hmm. can you walk it through, pretend like maybe I'm one of your agents. Mm -hmm. Can we go through it? Yeah, absolutely. So in quarter, end of quarter three, early quarter four each year, we kind of tee up the next year and what that's going to look like. And so first thing you kind of say, how many, how many closings do you want to do as a realtor? And then how many of those are going to be buyers? How many of those are going to be sellers? And you kind of start backing into it from there. So let's say, you know, let's say you're going to do 50 closings and 25 of each. We're then going to say, where are those going to come from? Right? So you're looking at your lead sources and the more years that you do this, the better it gets because the better de- better data you have specific to you. So for example, my showing ratio last year was significantly better than one of my colleagues, but my listing appointments closed um, was way worse. So my goal planning, how many list appointments I needed to go on to sell that number of houses was different than hers. So it's custom to each person as you kind of start to get year over year as you kind of see your personal conversion. And then you can also learn from each other. Okay, why why am I showing twice as many houses as you are to get a contract? And that's something else that's kind of fun out of it. So we go step by step through that process and then break it down as far as to what month are you going to be doing these closings? If you say you're going to do, gosh, what's 50 divided by 12? four and a half. If you say you're going to do, you know, if you say you're going to do four every month, that's That's good math. That's BS. Oh yeah. Right. I was like, oh crap. Where am I going with this? If you say you're going to do four every month, it's, Hey, you got to call BS again, because we all kind of ride the real estate roller coaster. We're in a seasonal business. So we're really setting like stretch goals, but realistic goals based on what you've done before, what other people have done. And then once you kind of get that business plan ironed out, then you can start saying, you know, okay, if, if, if 10 of those are going to come from open houses and you can see kind of what your open house ratio is from the past, do you need to be doing three every weekend? Do you need to be doing one a month? And then you can actually start putting your emphasis where it needs to go. Because I think what we used to do is we used to kind of just take anything and everything, any lead source that reached out to us that was selling us leads or, you know, oh, this person does postcards and that's working for them. Let's try that. This person does that. And then you're not really good at anything because you're doing everything. So we get really focused on where we want the business to come from. So then 
every day when you start to work or prospect, you know, you know where you're going ideally. A lot in there. Okay. Yes. So, so much. And I want to go like fully dissect this all every part of it. Okay. Same. Um, Balls deep. (laughs) We're going. Balls deep. So from the beginning, you mentioned, I mean, obviously a new, especially new agents or agents that I've never tracked, which so many agents do not track, do not Mm -hmm. track their numbers. So they don't have a frame of reference. I have no idea, you know, how many conversations I had in order to have my 50 closings this year, whatever it is. What do you suggest to that agent? Do you give them your numbers to start out? And then I want to go further into every single conversion. Like you said, a show and then comparing. Yeah, just let's start there. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. So we totally kind of are indeed this rip off and duplicated it from from a Tom Ferry conference that we attended. And he has a lot of good like averages for like industry wide. So I don't think averages are great because everyone is so different. And, you know, you can get a rock star and a terrible converter in that, but it's a place to start. And so he said, you know, if you're setting buyer consultation meetings, you know, 30% of those will turn into an actual buyer closing. So that was like something to start as a frame of reference. You also can probably just Google it, you know, but I wouldn't give them my numbers necessarily because I think a new agent actually probably is going to have to do a lot more showings to close a buyer than I will because they haven't learned how to set expectations. They haven't put all the processes in place or gotten to the level of, you know, just kind of finesse I found to work. Yeah. And I'm not even as great as a lot of other people, you know, so everyone's different, but I would say definitely err on the side, on the conservative side, because then worst case scenario, you're going to do better than you want it to do. So in that scenario, you know, I guess talk to other people, reach out to me. I'm happy to share kind of our team's numbers. It also depends where your business is coming from, right? So, you know, we've got five agents on our team and there are some things that look really similar between each of us, but there's some things that are really different. For example, you know, our best listing appointment closer almost has a has a very, very large SOI book of business. So the people she's meeting with, she really knows. Whereas someone else on our team that had a much lower listing ratio was going on internet lead listing appointments where those sellers were talking to multiple people. And so I think it goes back to like your experience and the source as well, because internet conversion is obviously going to have a different ratio than like your friend from church giving you a call. And maybe that's a good point to take us because I think you probably could tell Allie and I want to go really deep on this and because I feel like yeah. this is something that is so impactful to so many agents. And a lot of times on, on podcasts, they'll be like, reverse engineer your goals and then just keep moving, you know? Yeah. And then you're like, well, shit, man, how do I do that? Then so yeah. let's just pretend hypothetically, I, and we keep doing the new agent, but maybe it's, I'm, I'm not new. I'm like, you're, this is year two. My first year, I didn't fucking, I pulled shit out of my ass. I did 12. It was amazing. <laughs> But I don't know. And now I'm ready to get serious. So I'm going to double it. Or maybe we stick with your 50. That's fine. The 50 closings in year two, 25 and 25. So do we start with what is your marketing strategy? And what is that from what you've seen on your team? What are Mm -hmm. what are you guys using for your marketing strategy to do less? Because you said, don't do it all do less. Yep. Um, And maybe we start there. Yeah. One one quick thing to add to is like you mentioned, Kristen, it depends on which lead strategy you're going after. Because if it's cold call, I I actually read a book. Oh oh my God, what book? I think it was Ninja Selling where they have the chart out there for like just general conversion rates. You know, like I have it pulled up here because I put it into my real estate Bible. Mailers (laughs) is 2000 to one. That's the the typical conversion rate from mailers is 2000 to one. It's like the lowest converting. Cold internet leads 1600 to one going all the way down door knocking, personal contact, advertisement with your like advertising calls with your info, sign calls, 20 to one, open houses, 15 to one, pass buyers, nine to one, pass sellers, four to one, referrals are almost two out of every three. And that's like the best that you can get is obviously referrals. Yeah. So again, like going back to the Google, you can just Google it in case you have no fucking idea what your numbers are, but for uh, sure, it just, yeah. But anyway, yes. Going back to Shelby's question. Yeah. I mean, it'll get better every year. So we're probably going on just year three of kind of this really robust process. And each year it's gotten, you know, it's gotten closer to what it actually needs to be. And as the market changes and things shift, like it's not going to be perfect, but it's much better than saying, I'm going to sell 50 houses this year. And then, you know, December 31st comes, you look at, you know, your closings, you're like, 
okay, I sold 20. I wonder why, you know, uh, it's a lot more intentional than that. So um, this is a little bit off course, but I kind of, I kind of made up this thing just called like an advocacy meter. So whenever you meet like a total stranger, they're a complete skeptic, right? Like they've got, they know 16 realtors. They probably have two in their family. They've had a crap experience with one. They've watched TV for some others, you know, skeptics. They don't know anything about you to like total advocates for your business. Like people that are running around saying, Hey, you need to call Kristen Beam if you're going to sell a house, right? People fall all different places on that meter when you meet them. So the internet leads are going to be complete skeptics. And oh, by the way, they're interviewing 10 other agents and probably trying to get the best rate. And then your best friend from church is going to be a great advocate, like never sold a house with you, but like you're her best friend, you're her ride or die, you're in, right? So depending kind of where the source falls on that meter, and there's everything in between, right? The conversion is going to be different. So going back to kind of the practical sense, you know, this whole process starts with reflecting on the year past. If you're not a brand new agent, again, if you're a brand new agent, you need to make some assumptions, but it's reflecting on the year past. So starting with where did that business come from? And for you looking at that. So for me, you know, at the beginning, it was like nine or 10 different places, you know, which actually allowed us to make some good business decisions because we said, okay, you know, we're paying into this model to close four homes out of our 130 on the year. That doesn't make a lot of sense for us to be managing a whole business relationship, following all their processes for four closings, right? So we were able just to wipe that away and then create space for the ones that were actually closing 35 deals a year, right? So now when I get a lead or something like that, I can say, I always claim this one. I stop what I'm doing and claim this one because I know it's a producer and now I'm not even getting the other one. Does that make sense? Am I tracking? Dude, yes, totally makes sense. And I love that idea too, because a lot of times when you even try to do this with a brand new agent, it's in reality, you just need to go out and try stuff because you don't know what works for you. You don't know what you like, what's an authentic fit. And so just go try a bunch of things and then do what you did. Reflect like this has only got me four closings. This got me 35. Hell yeah. So, okay, perfect. I'm with you. And okay, so we've reflected and let's do this actually instead of me pretending. Let's do this as if we're Kristen. So, you know, what, what were the ones, what did you toss away? What did you keep? Yeah. Thank you for listening. Out of respect for your time, we want to make this show as valuable as possible for you. So if you have any feedback on how we can improve, please let us know. DM us at Allie the Agent and The Shelby Show. We used to be like Ramsey Partners, for example, in the Ramsey Network. That was like a referral partner of ours. Love Dave Ramsey, all his stuff, but it just wasn't making a lot of sense the way that we were converting them to how we were closing them. So that's a partnership that we as a business decided to kind of end. And then personally, like my top three places that I was getting business was from agent referrals, which was a big surprise at the time. I didn't think I knew that many agents in other places. Then client referrals and past clients, which you kind of hope and expect. And then kind of a tie between two internet sources. So we use OpCity, which is the back end of realtor.com. And then my agent finder, just another kind of internet source. And so for me, that gave a lot of clarity because at the time we had probably eight other internet sources that we were closing between one and five deals a year. But you know, every time your phone goes off or whatever, and you're in the middle of something, you're like, oh, I should take that, but I don't, you know, do I need to? And so now I know if my phone goes off for Op City or My Agent Finder, I stop what I'm doing and I take them because they convert and I deleted everything else off my phone, off my phone. So I kind of deleted a lot of the noise Love so I could make that. space for the noise that I needed to pay attention 80, to. 80, 20, 80, 20 all the way. Yes, yeah, for sure. But yes. until you crunch the numbers, you have no idea. Everything looks equal. Everything looks like business. Especially where, have you heard of that study that was done with the cold calling specifically? I don't know if it was just for real estate, but I think it was just cold callers, like sales, those that tracked, uh-huh. those that didn't. And those that did not track thought that they had the same amount of calls as those that did track. And obviously those that did track made way more fucking sales than those that didn't track. Yeah but they thought they did the same because uh, like one conversation went heavy that those that track, they tallied it as obviously one convo onto the next. Yeah. But then those that didn't track, they, the feel they're, they're just based off, based off feelings. You know, like there's not numbers, yeah. it's not black and white. It's, Ooh, that conversation hurt. That one felt like five big calls. And then they yep. just, at the end of the day, they over inflate, like way inflated the amount of conversations they thought they were yeah. having. Um, We are so good at that as realtors, like in all aspects, like we make things such a bigger deal in our heads, like all, you know, we'll think for an hour about how you're dreading 
having a certain conversation and then the phone call takes two minutes. And you're like, well, that was stupid. You know, I actually, I have a friend that he has marbles on his desk and he has two jars. So his contacts, he can't get up from his for the day from prospecting until his marbles move from one jar to the other. And it's just a really easy way for him to like tangibly see in front of him, like from here to here, from here to here every single day. And so you can't cheat yourself and be like, oh, I was on the phone for 35 minutes with one person. So I must have done 35 minutes of calls. It's no, you didn't. You talked to one person. That is so smart. Awesome. I like, yeah. <laughs> take the marbles. Yeah. Well, take the marbles. I'll shout out to you, man. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So going back, so we have you have done your reflection. We have your top mm-hmm. three lead sources. Do mm-hmm. you, are you perfectly split between buyers and sellers? No. What is, what is yours? Yeah. So I'm about, I mean, I'm pretty close relatively, but I'm about 55, 45 actually do had more buyers than sellers. And that's been pretty consistent for me the last few years, probably market driven, right? Like we're in a very low listing market, most of us. So that's part of it. But you know, a lot of people will say, Hey, you know, I want to be a 75 listing agent and a 25 buyer agent. And you're like, okay, that's cool. Last year you did 25 listing agent and 75 buyers agent. So how is that going to happen for you in one year? Right. And so that's where going back to setting the goals and kind of backing into it makes a lot of sense. Or if, you know, all of your, if all of the lead sources you have working for you are buyer leads coming in, but you're setting goals to close sellers, like you have a disconnect. And so that's really this whole exercise, which we spend so much time on up front so that then you can actually kind of create your reality. And I think, I mean, realtors are so guilty of that, right? Of saying, hey, I'm just going to go do this with no plan or way to get there. And then they wonder why they, you know, didn't do what they wanted to do. Okay. So we're back. We have, you have your lead sources, you have Mm -hmm. your buyer seller breakdown. Now Mm -hmm. are we, and we have our number, which we're just going to stick with 50, right? Yeah. Great. So, so now what, what do I need to do to break that? I have my goal. I have my lead sources. I have whatever and break it down further. Yeah. So a couple of things, you know, come next. So things that we track, obviously are listing appointments, initial, bu- initial buyer consultation meetings, showings, offers you're writing. Those are kind of our main like leading indicators. So you can usually kind of see, okay, I have to write two offers to get one contract in our market or something like that. And then we're looking at that every week and we're reporting that kind of in our team meeting. We've got a big spreadsheet. I actually put that in the, in the nugget if anyone wants to steal from it. So you're very visually seeing, okay, you know, we're almost two months into the year and you've written two offers, but you think you're going to close 25, 25 deals. Like you get gut checks along the way. So those are the big, the big things we're tracking, but then on a more personal level, kind of depending what your lead sources are, we're also making like daily or weekly key activities. So if you know, if part of your business is going to come from agent referrals, for example, you know, what are you doing to stay in front of your agents? Am I just connecting with people on social once a week? Do I have more of a, you know, I'm planning to put together kind of a more value add touch point to like my realtor friends throughout the year. That's not something I had on my radar at all. You know, we have that for our clients, our past clients to stay in front of them. But until I realized how, you know, where a big portion of my business was coming from agents, I didn't have that on my radar at all, right? So it's kind of influencing then like the projects that you need to implement as well. Something else for me, just, you know, just networks that you're in, whether it's friend group or church group or whatever, if you're getting business there, like just are you going regularly, right? That might be a weekly activity to go to church. So it's not even like working stuff. It's just being intentional about where you're spending your time. And, you know, it it, it varies by everyone based on where your business is coming from. I was listening to your podcast with the girl that did the Facebook group thing. Uh, she Lauren gets all her leads from like Griffin. Facebook groups. Yeah. yeah. She's like mom, mom, toddler, whatever stuff in Facebook groups, totally. which is super cool. I'm probably not going to go down that avenue because I've got my things right. I know to stay in my lane now, but like she does not need to be working on an agent touch point plan. You know what I mean? It's not, that wouldn't be relevant to her. I want to ask about the, the golden nugget. You mentioned the golden nugget, which listeners can get for free. Theagentgoldmine.com. This is so, I love this. Okay. I'm on tab three, which is the leading measures. And Mm -hmm. so this is just that like a highlight one sheet where you can see every single week, right? On the left-hand side, this is every single week for the whole year. Yeah. So it's like super, super clear whether they're getting listing appointments, buyer consultation, showing, 
client appointments, five-star reviews, closings, tallying that every single week. What, what else is on like the rest of these tabs. Can you elaborate on the golden nugget? And wait, before you leave that tab, can you, what is the hot, hot, hot? Hot. So those are your next two contracts. Like where are your next two contracts coming from? So we'll literally name like the listing or the buyer that we're working with. Basically it's the whole idea of if you had a gun to your head, right? Like where are you going to go? What are you putting your emphasis into? Right? So I think a lot of us think we have a big pipeline and for a lot of us, we do. But the emphasis kind of gets convoluted. If you've got 20 people in your pipeline, who are you actually pursuing and working expires? If you have someone ready to go that's writing offers and stuff, you should be, you know, looking at expires for them, looking at FISBOs, but you can't realistically do that for 20 people. So we name kind of where our emphasis is going every single week. And we fill this sheet out in our team meeting every week. So it serves as a couple of things for us. One, it's funny, it's in the golden nugget because we call it our gold star sheet. There's a lot of work you don't get credit for in real estate. If I sent you guys our real sheet that wasn't just a template, you would see we wrote like 10 offers last week and got two contracts as a team. The market is just challenging here. But you get kind of your gold star like from the team. Hey, you were out, you were hustling, you wrote your offers. It's also a little bit of accountability and friendly competition. So I don't want to walk into those meetings and say like zeros across the board, right? If I wasn't on vacation, I didn't have a baby. What were you doing? You know what I mean? And so it's just a kind of a healthy way for us to all be like, hey, you're rocking it or we got to step it up. Okay. And one more thing, Allie, before we leave this, because this, this, this tab is like really fucking cool, I think for the, so, and Allie listed all of the things that you guys are tracking. You just explained what the hot, hot, hot was for those two focus points across the top. And then just Mm -hmm. In case listeners are watch, like looking at this, just to confirm too, Kristen, under agent one, where it says zero yep. of 55, it's to bring it all the way back, 55 is the total number of listing appointments that they need to do in order to hit their 38 yes. total closings. You got it. So I actually just pulled it up as well because mm-hmm. I don't have everything memorized. But you'll see like we have five agents there and those are our real numbers actually for those five agents. I didn't, I didn't change them from last year. So you can see we all have kind of have different, we had different goals, but each person had different ratios. So that's kind of what I was talking about. You know, it was based on your success and your performance from, from the year prior. And then moving on to the next tab, the business plans. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. can, can you explain for those that want to download this, where should they yeah. click? Where should they not enter information as to not mess this up? Yeah. Good, good, good point. So I would actually start on this tab. So this business plan tab, we probably do three or four versions before we're like, yep, it's final. And that's why we start it like at the end of Q3, because that's where you're kind of winding down and you want all this to be done like final by January 1st or else you're already behind. Right. So the basically everything in white, you can type in everything in gray is like an auto calculation. So from gosh, what is it? Rows four to 16, those are your lead sources. So we were talking about, you know, where to start. So you're going to start with what your actuals were from this current year. Since we're in, you know, in Q3, Q4, hypothetically, you're going to put all your actuals in there. And then that's going to help determine your 2023 goals. So as we're going through this first part of the exercise, as team leads, we're coaching each other and our agents through this to be realistic, but also really intentional. So maybe getting rid of not putting any effort into things that were one, 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 and really kind of honing in on like your top three, again, to stay, stay really focused. So we get this part really nailed and dialed in before we move on. I love this. I love this page. I think this is so helpful. Yeah. If this is an activity. I want to go do this now where, and I know, <laughs> you know, Allie and I have both gone back and gone through, Hey, where have our leads come from? But this is all built out and formulated and makes it like very plug and play. Yeah. Okay. I don't think I have. And- questions on this. Do you, sorry, what were you going to say? Kristen? I was going to say, I track a lot of this throughout the year. Like I've got a spreadsheet every time I get a contract or a closing, like I put in the commission, the closing date, where it came from, but I don't really look at it or evaluate trends until we go to do this exercise. Right. So I'm always surprised Q3, Q4, like, oh, I had four closings from that one client. Sweet. Like probably should take them out to dinner or something, you know, because throughout the year it's, it's really, you get busy and you're like, thanks so much. And this is great. And you know, you overinflate some things in your head, like thinking some things were better than they were and you think some things were worse than they were. And so like numbers don't lie. I'm a big Excel freak, as you know, Shelby. So when you go back to here, it's kind of a nice fun way to reset each year and a way to get really intentional with your time. If you hate doing, if you hate door knocking and you're door knocking and 
you got two closings out of the year from door knocking, stop door knocking. There's so many other ways to go get business, right? Now, if you got like 45 from it, you're a door knocking expert and you're never allowed to quit. But I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it lets you kind of have control over your over your efforts without feeling like a chicken with your head cut off. Every time you get another marketing email or a sponsored ad on Instagram saying you need to do this or you can make money doing that, you can say, nope, I don't do Facebook groups, right? I just don't, right? Not this, not in this season because I know what's working and where I'm going to double down. 100%. How often do you go back to this and pivot, you know, like looking at, or yeah. how often do you tell agents to go back to this and, and readjust They're, They didn't meet their goals or maybe they crushed it. They're going above. Yeah. yeah how often? Yo, real quick, this podcast is not free. Cost of admission is sharing with a buddy who'd benefit or throwing it on your Instagram story. I guess we'll reshare that shit. Yeah, formally, like quarterly. So anything less than quarterly, I wouldn't actually change the goals. But I look at this, I mean, it, at least monthly. Honestly, I look at it more than that just to kind of see where where we're tracking. I'm going to jump ahead to the bottom of this sheet, but we we project exactly what months those closings are going to come in at, right? So I told you guys I'm expecting, I'm due in August. I'm not going to take like a real maternity leave. I'm a realtor. We don't really do that, but I'm going to work a lot less come August, September, you know, until I'm ready to, to rev up again. So I purposely am like front loading some of my efforts and then have some on the back end. That's like a personal example of naming that all out. If I say I'm going to close seven homes in May, which would be a big month for me, I'm probably not going to do it again in June because we all ride that real estate roller coaster a little bit where if you're putting all your efforts into your current contracts, you're probably not being the best prospector you could be. So we're kind of trying to predict some of that stuff in advance. So you're not setting yourself up for failure. I'm not saying I'm going to close 12 homes in January. Like January is historically my lowest month. Like I'm just not going to set myself up for that because I know I'll have to, you know, fail my goals or change them later. So being that you're setting yourself up now, like front, front loading, a lot of these conversations, the transactions, how, what are you working on now to start that transition? What are you going to not be doing after you have your baby and you're, you know, ha- spending time with your, with away from the business, who is yeah. going to be taking your place? Wh- what are you getting? What is, what's on the chopping block? Yeah. You know, I think there's always more you can be doing in real estate in sales of any kind. It's one of my favorite things about the gig and also one of the hardest things because you never clock in and clock out, you know, so you can always make another phone call. You can always send a property to someone that's not really looking, but they knew for the right thing. That kind of stuff is going to stop for me come, you know, that maternity leave time that I'm, that I'm mentioning, you know, if people I've been working with up until that point are then ready to go, ready to list their house or they find the home they like, those are the people I'm going to be making room for by taking off some of those other activities that are extras for me, if that makes sense. Do you see yourself doing more referrals, like outbound, just outbound referrals? Yeah. You know, we've got, we've got a fantastic team. We've got full five full-time agents on the team. So we already kind of work a little cohesively in the sense that, you know, if I'm, we do have a one-on-one kind of lead relationship with all of our clients. People don't just get ping-ponged around between the five of us. But at any given time, if I can't do a showing, you know, I'm out of town or something, like my team jumps in. You know, if I just got a contract and I go into labor, like my team will jump in the next day and be at the inspection. Like we've got a really seamless structure that we are very fortunate to have. I think that would that conversation would look a little bit different if I was like a solo agent. I would definitely be seeing, you know, where I could refer that business to. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I'm trying to imagine my, I'm actually like, I guess someone doing something similar where I am moving. <laughs> so trying to okay. wrap up loose ends and therefore yeah. just become like a completely just a referral agent. This, the majority of my business is just outbound referrals, but yeah, it's always, okay. who can I, who can I just, you know, just having that transition be smoother. I fell in love with the process, the process of prospecting. I love it. I think I'm pretty good at it. and. Now I just want someone else to follow through. <laughs> For sure. Do yeah. you know Juan Carlos? I don't even know his last name. He owns like Gold Bar and oh. he's friends with Ricky Caruth or I don't even know how to say his name. We we should get him on the podcast. You nailed it. Yeah. Juan, Juan was in the 30 under 30 group with me. Look him up. He is the master of what I think you're saying. And he's such a down to earth guy. He would like take your phone call anytime. But he basically built a roaring business in New York City and took himself entirely out of it with no interruption to his whole company. And he now lives in Florida. 
you know, he's got some model that he's just building all these other businesses and his New York businesses hasn't sacrificed. So I'm not the expert at that, but I think he might be if you want to call him. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Kristen, the, yes. I know you're a systems nerd, always loving that sort of stuff. So what are you loving now in your business systems wise, or what are you working on or, you know, that piece? I think we talked a little bit about Zapier last time you and I met, but that is something we've explored even more and just building, like we use Asana for a lot of project management stuff. So we have, I mean, we have a template for anything and everything you could think of. You know, when we get a review online, there's a template to create a social media post, thank the client. There's a 10, there's 10 steps to everything that we do. And something that's been really exciting and really rewarding as our team has continued to grow and we've got a greater support staff is just kind of removing myself and my business partner as bottlenecks to a lot of that. Because I think we've had a lot of good systems over the years, but we've been right in the middle of them. So something as simple as, you know, leads coming in, it used to be us you know, stopping what we were doing in the middle of a podcast, texting our agents and saying, who can take this, you know, and hoping someone answers because we claimed the lead and a lot of lead sources aren't team friendly, but they'll let you do team. So anyways, we found ways to systematize a lot of that, which has been really rewarding, not just for me, but for our agents, we can get more opportunities in front of clients. It's 2024. There's a better way to do just about everything. So it's happening in some of that. How did you systematize that piece for that specific example? The lead source? Yeah. Yeah. So depending on the lead source, like some will have the infrastructure that, you know, you can ring five phones or whatever, but a lot of them don't. So we've actually used Zapier to create like an automatic forward. So like one in particular, I'm thinking of, we get a text and an email to our business line when a lead is available to be claimed. So the Zap forwards that email to all of our agents and it just says, first come, first serve, someone take it. And so whoever claims it basically just has to shoot a text to our group and says, that was me, but they can log in and make contact with the client before I ever go track who got the lead. So it's just a little bridge in like coding, I guess. No, that's awesome. User-friendly coding thing. I was going to say anything that we find ourselves annoyed by, or this shouldn't be that hard, we write down and then we try and go solve it. Yeah. And that's always, that's oh, just, just clearing up that mental headache and or the burden of having to drive somewhere and open up the door, you know, after you just gave birth, you know, it's just not the highest (laughs) use of your time. So I want to ask about your field assistant. What, how are Mm -hmm. they paid? um, And what, what are the tasks that they do? Yeah. So we, she's actually newer to our team and she's also our office manager. So we've played with this role a few different ways and I still show most of my own property. I find that My clients generally want my personal opinion before they actually move forward on things, but personal preference there. So our office manager is actually full time and she is paid hourly, but her work looks very different every day. So it might be cleaning the office. It might be preparing for my next couple of days of listing appointments or buyer consultations. It might be running to pick up lock boxes or she she could definitely do a showing. She's licensed. So her job is really flexible and she just has to be really good at prioritizing that work. So it comes to setting expectations on our end and then knowing kind of where to, to plug and play. How, how have you set those expectations? And do you, being that she is newer to your crew or maybe newer in general, mm-hmm. how long do you expect to hopefully have her as a field assistant? Yeah, hopefully for a really long time. We are passionate about not hiring support roles to become future agents. Probably an unpopular opinion, but I think it's two very different skill sets. And if you want to be an agent, you shouldn't mess around learning the support stuff first. You should learn how to be a new agent first and get really good at that and then become a a better agent. So that's actually a big red flag to us when we're interviewing. If someone says, you know, I'm looking for this role as a stepping stone or because I want to be an agent, but I'm afraid of commission. That's a big red flag to us. I think there's a different, there's a different type of person and skill set that really, really enjoys the support role that enjoys supporting others that enjoys clocking in, clocking out, having a steady paycheck. And luckily the person that has is in, is in our, is in our family now definitely fills all of that. So 
of course that could change at any time, but I don't even remember your question. I'm going down my tangent of hiring. No, this is, per- this is perfect. Yeah. That perfectly answers it. Cause that's where I was kind of like going toward if a lot of, a lot of agents yeah. get licensed and they're great agents and some agents get licensed and realize oh, this is, you know, I would rather help support someone else. Cause this is not for me. I can't do this all mm-hmm. on my own. So how did you find, what kind of questions are you asking for like during that interview process? Where did you even, yeah. How did you find her? Yeah. We got really lucky, I'll say, but something you just mentioned, something that we look for when interviewing is someone's self-awareness. So you mentioned that, you know, you mentioned that some people like get into something like, oh, this isn't for me. I think some people know it's not for them long before they admit that, you know, we have a really high like failure rate for eight, for becoming an agent in the industry. And I think people often know, hey, this isn't really my thing. And then they try and make it work. And then they're kind of resentful at the job. They're not very good at the job. And they could be so much better, you know, just doing something else. And there's so many things you can do in real estate that aren't, you know, selling houses. You guys probably know better than me. You've done a lot of those avenues. But I actually interview kind of backwards. So my very first call with anyone that applies, it's 10 minutes or less. And we talk about compensation. We talk about how we don't offer insurance. We talk about you know, you're responsible for bringing your own car. There's a lot of driving involved in this particular role. We talk about start date. We talk about all the things that a lot of people save for when the offer is extended. And I've just found that if any of those things are a deal breaker for you or a deal breaker for us, like we can say, great, nice to meet you, move on in five minutes, as opposed to three interviews. So that's something we like to do. We actually started asking people to apply by sending us this past time. We said, send us the 10 reasons that you're best suited for this role. Anyone that just sent me their resume immediately was declined. So we've just found little ways to like weed people out, to trust our gut. We're not hiring experts, but we've got a really, really good team and we're really proud of them. Those are always super good tests to have, like something small, like something in the middle of like the giant job is like, hey, some small test. Text me the word potato. Yeah. You know, are you free of reading? (laughs) You know, or if they say that they're like super detail oriented and then they give you like a a resume with spelling mistakes or it looks crooked Mm -hmm. or anything like that, just automatically, no. Yeah, it's it's so true. It's like it's like the first grade test that read everything before yeah. you do anything. And the end of the test is don't do a thing, you know, yeah. which sounds which sounds kind of mean. But our work is really important, regardless of what role you fill in our team. At the end of the day, like we're talking about people's like biggest investments that we're, we're talking about big stuff, contractual deadlines, like really important things. And so we need someone that's detail oriented. We need someone to say, hey, you didn't outline this, this, and that, you know, I need someone to be able to speak up to me. So those are just some ways, you know, you can tell me you're detail oriented all day, but this is a way that you can show me. And we also get a snip of like people's written communication, which is like a little screening in and of itself. If they're exchanging emails with us, cause we email a ton with our clients. So, you know, having good grammar and punctuation and just good, I don't know, poise. Hi, Shelby exclamation point makes a big difference in an email than send me this. Right. So it's all just like little stuff we're picking up on along the way. Right. 100%. Be happy. Damn it. You <laughs> see me. Yeah. <laughs> to email me. Yeah. Yeah. We're just trying to get to know you and see if you'll fit in and be able to do a good job for us. And these are all little ways we've been able to do it. Going back a little bit to Zapier, you mentioned mm-hmm. you have a 10 step process for whenever you get a referral or did I, did I, did I mishear that? What is the process? Yeah. I think I was talking about like a testimonial, like a five-star review, review on Google or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, you, totally. You were. Yeah. Got it. Are you interested in in that or I, we yes. probably have something for referral too. I don't know. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, so yeah, it's yeah. I mean, it's literally like replying to the client, you know, on whatever platform it was, you know, creating a post for social media to give the agent a shout out, making sure we tell the team. So everyone can kind of celebrate the little success for, you know, agent Shelby got a five-star review or whatever. What else is on there? Oh, we, we added the master spreadsheet of ourselves because Google and Facebook randomly delete our reviews. So it's nice to just have a master sheet ourselves so we can, you know, as we're updating credentials and stuff, we can say we have over 300 five-star reviews or whatever it is. And we put it on our website. I don't know. It's nothing revolutionary, but it's all stuff that I'd randomly wake up in the middle of the night and be like, oh, did I, you know, did I reply to that on Zillow or just really dumb stuff? So we've taken all the like thinking out of the things that we've done a hundred times. And that's something we really geeked out about last time we spoke, Kristen, is like, the, and mm-hmm. by the way, Allie's the same way, checklist, crazy person. <laughs> And like systems in the way of it's not brain surgery. It's not rocket science. It's what do I need to do every single time in a checklist? Yes. Yeah. It just creates so much freedom like in your brain, right? If your brain's thinking about, did I reply to that Google review? It's not 
it's not its best self for, you know, your client or for your big business growth plan, whatever that looks like. So it's, it's like that whole freedoms and the discipline thing, you know, totally. it's if you just do the same thing over and over, like you take away the thinking from it. And I just want to make a little side note about how you mentioned Google will randomly delete stuff. And this is just, okay, thank you. Let's talk just two yeah. seconds about Facebook. Allie knows what's coming. I got my Facebook disabled like months ago. And in my, I'm like, I can get it back. I can get it back. And I'm like, I looked into it and I don't really like reading details or contracts or doing something like that. So then I tried to get Drake to do it, my husband. And then I tried to get my VA to do it. And then I tried to hire someone off Fiverr and it came back to me because, you know, the things ultimately always come back. They feel like, but anyway, that's another conversation. I I do. Drake and Cheska are amazing. This is no shade. But anyway, so I went through and then my shit's fucking disabled. Sorry for my French. And the thing that is really annoying about that, it's like we rely on these systems. We rely on Google reviews. We rely on Facebook and on yeah. Instagram. And a lot of us have built businesses around them through whether it's, you know, outreach through social media, you building up your following, you're staying in touch and all that stuff. But y'all know what? If you don't collect that data. The, yeah. These freaking meta, the wizards, they can just shut it off. And if you're like me, I'm disabled for life. Like I went, I went forever <laughs> so much. I'm disabled entirely. And yesterday oh I finally God. accepted what it. What did you do? Yeah. Did you deserve this? Or like um, well, what happened was I had someone who was trying to log in. You know how sometimes it'll be like a login attempt from Seattle or wherever. And I was like, yeah. that's not me. I tried to change password, hit a bunch of buttons. Oh, so I'm sure it's my, uh-huh. I pushed the wrong buttons too many times. It's a very Shelby thing to do. God forbid you tried to not let the scammer in your account. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I, l- yeah. I will take that. Although ultimately it no, is definitely my fault in some way. But anyway, you know, like I have photos from freaking high school, like my little homecoming that I will, they're gone now. <laughs> and my friends, it's a whole thing. So Allie currently I, is my only friend on Facebook with my new account. Wait, okay. So if I get a random request from you, it's, that's one friend. It's not spam. It's not it's a spam. Yeah, yeah. And listeners, it's not a spam. If I friend you guys, it is the new me 2024 with yeah. just Allie and Kristen as yeah. my friends. I do think you can't just totally boycott Facebook and Yelp and Google because they've taken a review down. You do have to play the game a little bit, but also maybe have your own, also maybe have your own record somewhere. Because I mean, we put, we put so much of our emphasis and faith into all these different platforms. And as soon as you get good on TikTok, it's not a thing anymore. And as soon as you get good on whatever, I mean, you just have no idea. So yeah. Do do both and when she when Shelby That's sent me that friend did. request yesterday, I was like, Shelby, look, you got spammed again. I'm gonna block it. <laughs> she goes, No, it's me. <laughs> so I took a screenshot. <laughs> I was like, I took a I took a screenshot for future reference, just so everyone knows That's Shelby happening. only has one friend. <laughs> that one friend is me. That's happening. People are <laughs> yeah. doing like duplicate accounts and they're spammy. It's so yeah. weird. You yeah. can't trust you can't trust anything. And then there's AI and then you know whatever. a lot of it. Uh, is because of third party apps, like a lot of third party apps, even though they seem very, very helpful, they're just not approved by meta. They're not approved by Instagram. So, and then, you know, with a click of a button, you don't know, or you don't know what your virtual assistant is using to help out their business to then help you out. And they don't know the rules. So, you know, because if you're not going to be reading about your own Facebook, they're surely not. (laughs) And then (laughs) you're going to have your Facebook deactivated, like Instagram deactivated. There goes everything. If you're getting like if if all of your lead generating eggs are in one basket, which is Instagram or yeah. Facebook, and you lose it, that is tough. So that yeah, would don't be weary yeah. of these a, third party apps. Yeah, I read a long I heard a long time ago, the number one lie in the world is I have read and agreed to these terms and conditions. It's, it's like I've 100%. never read one, I've never so. read it. Yeah, no one has. If they said yes, I'm like, you're a psychopath. Yeah, it's funny. Oh, I don't even know how we got here, but I like it. It was a <laughs> fun day. Yeah. I think at this point, I think Goals. we pivot. And we would like to know what the future holds for you, Kristen. Oh, I should have prepared for this because I think you asked me yeah. this last time. Or you need an updated version of what the future holds. She's Gosh. still baby. Um, <laughs> it's it's still coming. pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, we're going to do more of the same. I think we're working harder in the industry for for less to say really easily like we're it's harder to get transactions and commissions are going down but I think it creates a lot of good opportunity because it gets rid of 
a lot of the people that wanted it to be easy or that don't have good systems in place because if you're not doing that many transactions, it's not worthwhile and then your quality suffers. So I think there's huge opportunity for people like of our size that are not dominating their market necessarily, but are are doing really well. So I don't know how long that's going to be where that, you know, where that potentially shifts. But in a weird way, I think it's really exciting that a lot of agents aren't renewing and stuff because for a long time, I have felt like this industry is treated very largely as a hobby. And it's not a hobby. It's a profession. It's a big deal. What we're doing for people, we should be trusted advisors. And so I don't know, just overall, I'm really excited like for the opportunity for our team. That means probably adding a couple of agents this year for people that share in that passion that have really high ethics that really value process to then turn around and give a better client experience at just a higher caliber of service. So I think that's really exciting, but tangibly, we're not going anywhere. We're going to do more of the same this year. And that's what helps with like the, the 10,000 hours, well, the 10,000 10, iterations, you know, in order for you to can become even more of a master of what you're already really good at. Is there anything that we, that we didn't cover before we head to our wrap up questions? Apple listeners, this short pause is to ask you for a review. Here's how to do it. Back out of the specific episode, go to the page where you see all the episodes, scroll down, keep scrolling. Perfect. Now tap those five stars. Thank you so much. Back to the show. Not really relevant, but just something that's been on my mind. We, as a group, read the book Boundaries together, just all of our agents. Have you guys read Boundaries? No, I haven't. read the Cliff Notes. (laughs) <laughs> the cliff notes. Okay. Yeah. So it's actually like a biblical based book about like relationships and stuff, but we thought it'd be really relevant for realtoring because, you know, there's very little boundaries between clients and agents and, you know, especially in how fast the market is. And, you know, it's hard to like time block and set your schedule. So we've had a lot of good conversations around that as a group lately. But the thing that keeps coming back to me is know what can break know what your exceptions are to your boundaries. Because at the end of the day, we're in like a customer service business. And like, ultimately, you need to know you can't just say I don't work Saturdays and Sundays or whatever that is. That's not realistic. So I don't know, for me, it's been kind of freeing to actually figure out, okay, I've set a lot of these boundaries, I've got a pretty good structure in place. It's fun to know, no, for if we're writing offers, like I'll get up from the dinner table, you know, like an offer, I'll answer my phone for a dinner table, but I won't do that just to schedule some showings. So finding like the things that break what I said I was going to do and giving myself permission to do that has been something just top of mind lately that may help another agent out. Dude, I love that you brought that up because there's something really freeing about taking those, like you said, the boundaries and making them like rules for your life. Mm-hmm. Uh, non-negotiables. I recently heard, yeah, yeah. And there it was one that I heard recently where it's someone's personal rule was like, I never say yes on the spot. I just don't do it because he's, I always used to do it. And then I would end up at these events I didn't want to go to. I would always have this year. And so now my personal rule for life is I do not say yes. And all I say is I, I will get back to, you know, it's a rule, personal rule of mine. And I'll let you know within 24 mm-hmm. hours and that time, like you have the time to figure out if it's really. And so just like being yeah. able to like know your own personal rule, whether it's mm-hmm. the showing the dinner, the, you know, offers, or it just helps alleviate some of that weight and anxiety and stress that comes with our day to day. So I love for that. sure. Mm. Yeah. Or feeling guilt or resentment, like when you do something different, right? You know, give yourself the freedom to do, you know, what the rule is versus the exceptions. Totally. I should probably add okay. more oh, yes. like, I should probably add more like life rules to my, I, so I have a, I have a note on my app, on my phone. It's a whole note that says Allie's life rules. I will never bend on these life, life rules. They are, they are so strict. You know, I, are you about I to share them with going, us? Yes. Because uh, the, yeah, the list is not too. long. But the reason why I mentioned <laughs> okay. this before is I should add more life rules to this. My one and only rule on there right now is to never fly frontier or spirit. <laughs> That's literally it. I have been fucked over so many times. I'm like, God, I cannot. No more. That's my only life rule. So maybe so I should add funny. a little think before I say yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. But. Okay. The way you teed that up, like I, I would have not guessed that's where that was going. <laughs> this episode really is not brought, brought to you by Frontier. <laughs> <laughs> she's also the girl okay, who said, I, text me potato. In the, so she's kind of like, she's out there. But anyway. Yeah. In the, in the job post. Yeah. 
No, I mean, I don't, I've never gone spirit, but I don't like frontier. I don't blame you. Yeah. But no. I would have an exception to that rule. If someone was going to pay for me to go somewhere super cool, like you I'd would never get or... there. No, I still wouldn't. You pay for it all you want. <laughs> I do not want, I will not. I'd rather walk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Heading to our wrap okay, up question. Got, there's got to be some stories there, but that's probably for another day. <laughs> you just, yeah. Next time. You, what Next you can time. imagine. Next time. Next time. Our yeah. first wrap-up question. Next podcast question. is like, why to never fly Frontier? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Brought to you by American Airlines. Okay. <laughs> Our favorite hour. What is your favorite app or tool in either your business or personal life? Mm, probably still Asana. I love Asana. It like just ma- runs my life. It's like my personal little assistant. Or Instagram. I'm a big Instagram fan. Tell Instagram about my life. Great answers. Okay, what events are you going to in the next 12 months? I know you have a baby on the way, so. Yes, like nothing pretty much right now, which is kind of liberating, kind of nice. Amazing. Yeah, I might go to the 30 under 30 meetup in New York in September, but it'll be a game time decision. We'll see. And we just got back from the Hero Nation retreat. So that was fun in Dallas. What's that? I don't think I have any of the- I work with Wayne Salmons. He has like a coaching business and it's called Hero Nation. And mm. we all stayed in this giant house in the middle of nowhere in Texas. That was totally different than anything I'd ever done with 30 people I'd never met, but it was super fun. Nice. Okay, cool. And then how can we yeah. or the audience help you in your business? I don't know. Let me know if you're using that goal planning tracker. That'd be super fun. I'd love to hear about that. I'm going to help you um, out too, Chris. And send her referrals. You can follow us online. I like to meet people online and followers are good. So that's our next question. KB Collective. Yes. Where can people find We're you? We're going there. Instagram is probably the best at KB Collective or at KB Collective Real Estate. Wow. Or at Kristen Beam. That one's mixed with a lot of photos of my toddler because she's a lot cuter than me. So that's fun. Perfect. And if you want to hang out with me and Allie, we are Allie the Agent and the Shelby Show on the gram. As always, we want your feedback. And guys, this this tool is partic- the golden nugget is particularly amazing. So go to the agentgoldmine.com and get her golden nugget. Don't miss it. And guys, otherwise, oh, last thing, if you're not watching these on YouTube, go over to YouTube and subscribe and like everything we do, obviously, and watch all of it. Okay. <laughs> listeners, that is all we have for today. Kristen, thank you so much for coming on the show. And listeners, this is for you. Be a bro and share this show. Bye. Thanks so much for listening, dude. If you want the golden nugget that this guest provided, see the show notes or just go straight to theagentgoldmine.com. That's where we keep all our resources for you. Till next time.